come, let us gather in reverence and awe, for the Lord our God is our defender, fighting our battles and securing our victories. And this is In The Moment. I'm your host, Reverend Ricky Allen Jr., thanking you as always for this lovely day the Lord has made. And wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I just pray that the Lord Jesus Christ is out front as always. Yes, we say it every time because it's our consistent prayer for you. I just pray that whatever you're doing, that you're doing it with the Lord Jesus Christ in mind, that you let the Holy Spirit guide you more than ever before. Considering where the world is and where it's going, we must hold on to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Now, let's get started. Our morning scripture comes from 2 Chronicles 20, 15 through 17. 2 Chronicles 20, 15 through 17, which reads, He said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Who needed to hear that today? Who needed to know that the Lord Jesus Christ goes with you into your conflicts and struggles and fights the battle for you and you don't even have to lift a finger? Isn't God good all the time and all the time God is good? Let us pray. Almighty God, our protector and defender, we come to you with hearts full of gratitude and trust and thanks in acknowledging your sovereignty and power over every challenge we face. Just as you have fought for your people throughout history, we ask that you fight for us today. Someone out there right now, Lord, is facing a battle that they're trying to fight on their own and they don't know you. They need to know you. And we pray, Lord, that you reveal yourself to these people. We confess that there are times when the battles we face seem overwhelming, when our strength gets weak and our courage gets small. And in these moments, remind us that the battle is not ours, but yours. You are the mighty warrior who goes before us, securing our victory, and delivering us from the hands of our enemies. We pray for your protection over our lives, our families, our communities, and our nation, if not the world completely. Surround us with your presence. Place a hedge of protection around us that no enemy can penetrate. Give us the faith to stand firm in your promises, knowing that you are our refuge and strength and ever a present help in trouble. In the name of Jesus Christ, we lift up those who are struggling with fear and discouragement. We ask you to comfort them with your peace, which surpasses all understanding. Fill their hearts with the assurance that you are in control and that you have not forsaken them, and that your plans for them are good and not for harm. We also pray for wisdom and discernment as we navigate this thing called life. Guide our steps and help us trust in your timing and in your ways. When we are tempted to rely on our own strength and knowledge, remind us to lean on you and not on our own understanding. For your power is made perfect in our weakness. Lord, we thank you for the countless times you have delivered us in the past, for the victories you have secured on our behalf. Help us to remember your, your faithfulness and to testify of your goodness to others. May our lives be a living testimony to your power and love. And as we stand before the battlefield of life, we do so with the confidence knowing that you are with us we declare your victory over every situation we face and we commit to walking in the faith that we hold, not by the sight that we have. Strengthen us, Lord, for the journey ahead and fill us with the Holy Spirit that we may stand firm and see the deliverance you will bring. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 
Our topic today is the God who fights for you. The God who fights for you. Do you know that not only is God love, not only is he peace, but God's a warrior. God's a fighter. And God will fight for you. You know, we we have placed this condition. The world has placed this condition on how we view the God that we serve. The purposes that they have for us is we'll just do. You know, no 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 spirituality, just all functionality. Just just do and if you do, we'll be everybody will be happy and you'll be welcomed into spaces that are completely filled with sin and disobedience. But they won't give you any problems as long as you just keep the God stuff out of the way or at a minimum and just do the things your Bible says to do. You know, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, things of that nature. But yet on the other side of that, they can attack us, they can say what they want to us, they can, they can do what they want in our spaces and think that our God's not going to respond. Well, I'm here to tell you that you got a God that fights for you. Not only just loves you and cares for you, but you got a God that fights for you. And our scripture comes from 2 Kings 19, 32-37. We pick up after our fantastic Mother's Day, uh, you know, in the story of Hezekiah dealing with King Sennacherib. And so we're now on the other side. 2 Kings 19, 32-37 reads, Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with a shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter into this city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David my servant. That night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, they were all dead, all the dead, the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. One day, while he was worshiping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons, Adramelech and Sherezar, killed him with the sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat, and Shaddon, his son, succeeded him as king. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reading of Yari's blessed word. We ask you now, Lord, to help us dive deeper into your word as always. Say what needs to be said, do what needs to be done for the glorification of your kingdom. And for all those who are watching and listening, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. As I said, we're picking up from where we left off a week ago when we said to ourselves, I don't think you know the God that I serve. And in that thought, we came to realize most folks don't know the God we serve based on the following, because they use psychological warfare and the rhetoric of being invincible. We know these people. Because they don't know our relationship with him, so they will talk about him as if though he's like every other God in the world. So when the enemies of God try to intimidate, challenge your relationship with him, threatening the space that God has you residing in, there is only one thing left to do. Go to God. Don't try to handle this yourself. Go to God. This is where we left off with King Hezekiah, King of Judah. In chapter 18, Israel has fallen, and now the march was on to take down Judah by way of an Assyrian king named Sennacherib. Negotiations have failed. Uh, harsh language has failed. God has intervened with giving this king distractions. And after distractions, we read in chapter 19. But even through all of that, this Assyrian king still has his eyes on Judah. From verse 10 to 12, we get more intimidation and harsh language that attacks the people, uh, the people's faith and God. And, he, and King Hezekiah's response is one that we should all take note of in verses 14 through 19. He takes the letter that was sent by the Assyrian king, reads it, and then heads to the temple. And why is that? Because he knew they didn't know the God that he served. And so he goes to the God that he serves, spreads out for God the letter for review, and then prays to God at this level of confidence. He prays for the deliverance of Judah, of course, but then he prays for all the kingdoms on the earth to know 
who the God we serve is. Are you praying for your deliverance from whatever you're dealing with with people and places? And are you also praying for them to come to the saving grace of Jesus Christ? Because it's not enough to know that they don't know. It's the understanding that we as believers want the world to know who our God is and the redemptive work of his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins to save us. In going to war, we understand that we don't want nobody to get hurt. We don't want nobody to die. But we have a God that fights for us when they come for us. And when God sees that you have absolutely surrendered your status on this earth to his hands and you love him and trust him in your complete obedience and submission, you get to bear witness to a God that fights for you. Throughout God's word, he tells us his position in our situation of defense. Uh, in, in times of war, in Deuteronomy 20, verse 4, he says, For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. In Joshua 1, when God is commissioning Joshua to take over the leadership of the people, he tells him in verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and be courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. When King Jehoshaphat was staring down a threat from the Moabites and the Ammonites, in Second Chronicles 20, if you scroll down to verse 14, where it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came to Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jeriel, the son of Metaniah, the, a Levite and descendant of Asaph. He stood in the assembly and he said this, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in jo Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of, the Lord, or because of his vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. That's why I'm so glad today to tell you that you have a God that fights for you. Many of you are in the middle of a battle or battles, plural, right now. But if you hold on to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, casting off your doubts and your fears that you see and experience, you will bear witness to the amazing work of the Father that loves and cares for you. For it is written in 2 Corinthians 4, 16-18, Therefore we do not lose heart. You hear that? Don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You have a God that will fight for you regardless of what you see, what you hear. And even through, it looks and feels like doom and gloom at times, you feel abused, violated, ashamed, guilty that you're in the spot you're in and you hope you could do more to solve the problem, but you just can't bring the, you can't get it together. None of your plans are working. And so you bring the problems to the Lord. You take your hands off of it. You surrender and you say, do you hear what they're saying about you, Lord, and the people that love and trust you? It puts things back into perspective with an expectation that God will do what he has promised to do in the care and defense of his people. But back to the scene at hand. We're sitting here, Hezekiah, has spread everything out. He has prayed to the Lord for the deliverance of his people and for the revelation of, the, of God to everybody in the world, kingdom-wise. Now we're at verses 20 through 21 where the prophet Isaiah sends the message to Hezekiah, conveying the Lord God's message to Hezekiah, affirming that God has heard his prayer regarding Sennacherib. And then there's God's judgment on Sennacherib, verses 21 through 24. God rebukes his arrogance and blasphemy, highlighting Jerusalem's scorn towards him. And then he go, we see God's sovereignty in verses 25 through 26, where he explains that this is all part of the bigger plan. God has it all under control. And if we can remember that in our conflicts, we can do two things. 
We can remember that God is sovereign and have hope. And then he provides a sign for Hezekiah and promise of restoration. We see that in verses 29 through 31. God provides a sign of temporary reliance on natural growth, followed by a promise of Judah's future prosperity. God has given a conceptual, eternal view of what's going on. He first acknowledges he has heard Hezekiah's prayer. That's verses 20 to 21. Next, he rebukes the arrogance and blasphemy and all these things. And now God doesn't just lay on the eternal perspective. He also gives the natural order of operations here on earth, presenting the plan of how he's going to deal with Hezekiah's problem. And this is where you got to understand that you've got a God that will fight for you. How do we know this? This is the God who dismisses the threats. The passage begins with God's declaration through the prophet Isaiah. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city or shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mount against it. We see that in verse 32. Here we see God dismissing the threats of the enemy. The king of Assyria, with all his boasting plans, is rendered powerless before the sovereign will of God. It doesn't matter what they did to the other places because the other places serve idol gods and you serve the true God. It is a re it, it, it's, it's relevant to where we are today as followers of Christ. It doesn't matter what victory Satan and his demons have in the social economic structure because the foundation that was laid by Christ through his birth, death, and resurrection remains unmatched and unbeaten. This is why we said it first. I don't think they know the God that we serve. No matter how intimidating our adversaries may seem, God has the final say. He dismisses the threats against his people, ensuring that the enemy's weapons will not prosper. And you know what? You've got to believe in that. I, it can't, you, no one can make you do that. You got to see it for yourself. The God who fights for you is the God who protects his city, by the way. In verse 33, God continues, By the way that he came, by the same he shall return, and he shall not come into the city, declares the Lord. God assures his people that the enemy will not enter the city. Instead, they'll be turned back. Here we are reminded of God's protective nature. He places a hedge around his people, safeguarding them from harm. Do you know the day that he stands the fortress around your life and mine, shielding us from the plans of the enemy? When we are under his protection, we can rest assured that we are secure. And it is through our advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ, this protection in our time is given for God has given us all over to Jesus Christ. It is written in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Here it is. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus says in John 14, 16, when asked about the way, he answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So it's not enough just to say, I believe in God. But you have to come into relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has to know you, otherwise there is no access. You can't jump the line. You can't supersede Christ because God has given everything over to his son, and he is the only way to eternal life, and the only way your life on earth can move towards that life you desire to have in heaven. And that's a problem for you. If that's a problem, Know that I care enough to tell you the truth and care less about what your truth has told you about God's way. The God that fights for you fights for his people, by the way. Verse 34, here is this triumphant declaration. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. God takes it personal. 
He doesn't delegate this task to others. He himself steps up and steps in to fight for his people. Here are people who have basically said to his people, don't you dare lean on the God you serve because it hasn't worked for no one else. And when we turn our, to our Lord to let him know what they said about him, not us, because it's not about me. It's all about Jesus. It's all about God. Always know this. And this is something I keep in mind when people say things to me or do things towards me or towards my family. God heard it. God saw it. God didn't like it. God is on his way. Because the God who fights for you is not going to let his people get treated like just any other group of people with a God they trust. No, he's our Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the author and finisher of our faith. He's our savior, our branch. He is the living word of God. He steps into the battlefield ensuring victory, not just for our sake, but for the sake of his name and his promises. And when he's done with your enemy, they will know you serve a God that will fight for you and has no problem pulling up and making himself known to even them in hopes they too will come to know him. God doesn't want no one to go to hell. Yet hell exists because of the choices people make. And he knew they were going to make it. He wants you to choose the light. Regardless of what you can do in the dark. Regardless of how it feels and how enticing it is. Choose the Lord Jesus Christ. The God who fights for you delivers miraculous victory, by the way. If you didn't know that, now you know. In verses 35 through 37, we see God's physical response. And that night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived at Nineveh. And he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his god, and Adrelamech and Shazazar, his sons, struck him down with the sword and escaped into the land of Ararat. And Esaradon, his son, reigned in his place. And one night, keep this in mind, and one night, God turned the whole tide of the battle, wiping out the enemy and securing peace for his people. This is the epitome of divine intervention. No one was used, no human strategy or instructions, just God. And it's important to pause here because we got to realize that sometimes, if not all the time, we need to understand that in solving problems, God does not need us to help him with anything. He can handle it all himself, but we got to trust in the fact that God delivers. You cannot apply human understanding to God's response because you're the one that said you gave your life to Christ. You're the one that's going through it. Hello? You are the one is that is praying for God to intervene. That's all you. Take delivery of his response and know that you have a God that fights for you. Regardless of what you think about how he responds, God is the one who solves the problems completely. Humanity has spent more time trying to solve problems that a because of a lack of biblical standard that we have talked ourselves into a society that advocates sin but complains about the problems sin causes. Then they get mad at the people who stand on the promises of God, threatening them, and then get mad when our God responds. We serve a God that is realer than you would ever imagine, and it doesn't need a lot of people to get his point across. He does not need a lot of people to get his point across. We serve a God that is very much aware of your circumstances, but want you to know that you know that he saw it too, he heard it too, and he will bring you around and if you bring it to him in your faith in Jesus Christ and let the Lord thy God take care of it for the glory of God's kingdom and for your benefit then we can face our own impossible situations and trust that God is capable of delivering us in ways that surpass our understanding he is the God of miraculous victories, but you got to trust in him in all aspects of your life, though. Say, you know, when I would, you know, if you're going to 
sit here and say you believe and sing the hymns and go to church and do Bible study. And then when the rubber hits the road, you don't really trust in everything. You're not going to see what King Hezekiah saw. So I'm going to finish it up like this. Once upon a time when my sons, uh, we was at the playground, me and my wife was carrying to the playground and stuff throughout the week and all that. And uh, there was this really tall metal slide. I don't know if y'all remember the metal slides back in the day, but I do for a reason. I'm going to tell you. I told my, he looked at it, both my oldest son and then my youngest son kept looking, they were pointing at it. And I said, hey, if you go up that slide, I'll catch you. I'll catch you down the bottom. Say less. Those guys broke for that slide like it was candy on the top. And I think my youngest actually knocked the kid down, but that's neither here nor there. They, they, they went up the slide, they had no doubts. They went up the ladder, they had no doubts. That thing was high in the sky, they had no doubts. Why? Because they trusted in the words of their father. Their father told them, I'm gonna catch you, go up the slide. And they went up the slide, they got situated, and they came down. I caught them forgetting they had a wool jacket on, and that was a metal slide. And I was shocked out of my life. Literally, static electricity, people. Static electricity. And this went on for about five rounds. But here's the thing, though. Regardless of the conditions they came down, they had faith in knowing their father was going to catch them. And I'm here to tell you today that in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if you you want to go up if you want to get higher in your faith to go up that ladder of faith to get higher in your faith with the Lord Jesus Christ the only thing you need to do is believe that when you go up and when you come down the Lord Jesus Christ is going to catch you why because he said he was going to catch you he you got to trust in the Lord's words when God says he's going to fight for you he's going to fight for you when God says that he the battle is not yours it's his you better believe it when God says step out the way and let me take care of this. I am the Lord thy God. Trust in his words and let God do what God does best, and that is fights for his people. Yes, God loves. Yes, God is light. Yes, God is a provider. Yes, but God is also a fighter. And you need to remember that as you are dealing with people and dealing with things that require not your effort, but God's effort to take care of it through his divine intervention for the glory of his kingdom and for your benefit. So wherever you are right now, if you need prayer, if you need to understand this, reach out to us. Let us know, hey, um, I need help. I need, to, I, I need to really lean on the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, but my faith is weak. Let us come alongside you. Go to AIM Christian TV and go to our page and send us an email. We would love to hear from you. There is no issue. There's no shame in that. There's no guilt in that. Maybe you have not trusted the Lord at this level, but we're trying to get you there because we love you and we care for you. And we appreciate to know that we are doing something to help you get to that level of faith where you can go up that ladder of life and come down that slide and understand that the Lord Jesus Christ can catch you the same way I caught my children. So may God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. And God willing, we will see you again next week. You take care.